Hi, my name is Sanskrit Raghav, and today I am going to convince you that the piano is the coolest instrument. Let's begin. So, you might be wondering, who's that cool guy playing that cool instrument, sitting in this cool place? Well, that's me, a couple years ago at San Francisco Botanical Gardens during their flower piano event. I have been learning piano for five years now. I play on both an acoustic piano and an electronic keyboard. I love listening and, as you can see here, performing music. And I'm a proud member of the Eternity Music Band for one and a half years. So let's get right to it. Why is piano the coolest? Now I'll have to go into a little bit of background knowledge for this. Music has four time periods, Baroque, Classical, Romantic, and Contemporary starting around the 1700s with Baroque and lasting until today. Each period lasts around 50 to 100 years, and each has their own distinct musical style. Well, for the first reason why piano is the coolest, it has the largest repertoire. There have been 154 composers in the Baroque, Classical, or Romantic periods alone. And once the 1900s started with the contemporary era, it had a sort of, well, explosion. There have been so many different composers since the beginning of the 1900s, and the number of people who play piano, well, it's almost too many to count. Next, the piano is the coolest because it has an unparalleled musical range. Again, I'll have to go into a little bit of background knowledge here. An octave is a series of, well, 12 notes that repeat itself in different pitches. I'll play it right now. A piano has the largest musical range of any instrument because it has seven of those octaves in different pitches, plus another four, note, four notes, three at the bottom, and one at the very top. Next, most instruments can't accompany themselves because they can only play one or two or maybe three notes at the same time. However, on a piano, every finger you play on the keyboard is one note. So you can play from anywhere from one note to three notes to six notes to eight notes. And finally, the piano is extremely adaptable to almost any style of music, from Baroque with Bach, classical with people like Mozart and Beethoven, romantic, contemporary, rock and roll, jazz, blues, pop music, ragtime, and many, many, many more genres. And if you're still not convinced that piano is the coolest, you see, Billy Joel wrote this song called Piano Man, and I haven't heard of a violin man. <laughs> now, on to the types of acoustic piano. I won't be including electric keyboard here or electric piano because Davy did a great presentation on that just a week ago. Please go check it out. Back to acoustic pianos. When most people think of a piano, they think of a grand piano because of its unique shape and, well, grandness. Some grand pianos are so large that they can take up most of a moderately sized room. For people who don't have the space or the money, for a grand piano, many grand pianos retain the richness of sound and unique shape while taking up less space. And for someone who really doesn't have enough space, the upright piano is still a piano and is very extremely compact like the one I have right here. These pianos can range in price from around $500 to $1,000 to $5,000 to $500,000. Don't worry, most upright pianos can be sold used for around $500 to $1,000. Next are the parts of a piano. The piano has 88 keys, and at first it might seem like a percussion instrument, after all, there are no strings and you don't blow into the piano. However, a piano is actually a string instrument. If you take it apart, you'll find that there are multiple strings and hammers which are attached to the keys. Every time you press a key, the hammer hits actually a series of strings, which is why there are 230 strings in a piano, yet only 88 keys. Aside from this, there are three pedals which add different musical effects to the piano, a frame to give it an overall shape, a soundboard, which turns the sound of the metal strings getting struck by the hammer 
into the classic piano sound, one stool, <laughs> and one or more people. Here are some pictures of the parts of a piano. Here are the keys, and as you can see, here is the soundboard. On a grand piano, there are actually two soundboards, one beneath the strings, and one functioning as the lid. As you can see, up close, you can see the multiple strings for each hammer. Here are the hammers, and here are the three pedals at the very bottom of the piano. Now, on to the physics, or mechanics of a piano. Put very simply, when you press down on a key, the hammer hits more than one string, causing the strings to vibrate and resonate. In order to go a little more in-depth to this, this Jeff should do. The piano key is almost like a seesaw. When you press down on this end, a complex mechanism causes the hammer to hit this string here. You might also be wondering what this is. This is a damper. It actually is what mutes the string so that every time you let go of a key, it actually stops vibrating. In order for a key to make any noise when you press it, the back end of the key has to lift up the damper, allowing the string to vibrate freely. The damper is also an important part of the rightmost pedal. When you press down on it, it lifts the damper for every single string on a piano, allowing the string to vibrate long after you've left your hand from the key. Again, I said before, that every hammer hits two or three strings when you press down a key. If you want to play softer, the leftmost pedal, also called the una corda pedal, shifts the entire hammer mechanism to the right so that you can play more softly. Actually, when you translate una corda into English, it translates to one string, so it's kind of self-explanatory. The middle pedal is a very recent addition to the piano, so it varies between models. For some pianos, it lifts the dampers only for notes that are being held before the pedal is pressed. For notes played after, the, the dampers are not lifted. For other pianos, including mine, it lifts the damper only for some of the lower notes. And finally, on some pianos, it acts as a version of the una corda pedal with the lock mechanism, so a player can practice quietly without disturbing others. And finally, the soundboard. The soundboard is a board of wood on the back of an upright piano and functioning as the lid and another one below the strings of a ground piano. It's responsible for converting the sound of the metal strings into that classic piano sound. The extremely important function of the soundboard requires the wood be used to make it has to be straight. This is why spruce is used by piano makers for the soundboard. Recently, I was watching a segment of CBS Sunday Morning and I saw this interesting documentary about Fazioli pianos, which is Italian piano makers. They, take the, they make their soundboards out of red spruce found in the, Italian, in the heights of the Italian Alps. The red spruce is used in the Fazioli pianos because of its lack of notch and its extremely straight grain, so it has lots of resonant qualities. The lack of knots is actually caused because of the lack of air at the high altitudes in the Italian Alps. That's very interesting. Again, I said the range of a piano is seven octaves and four notes. And a piano's sound or timbre can vary depending on which piano you play. A piano can have a light, bright, almost metallic at times ping, or a more mellow, grand sound. The reason for the difference in sound is the hammer. The hammer has two parts. As you can see, the wooden felt and the wooden hammer core and the cloth or the hammer felt. A stiff hammer felt means a brighter metallic sound, while a softer hammer felt means a grand sound. This might seem a little counterintuitive first, but think of it like this. A softer felt has more give and will transfer more energy into the strings while a stiffer felt has less give and will cause less energy to go into the strings. So that's all you need to know in order for the parts of a piano. Now it's time to play. Here are a couple of things to remember. For posture, you should always sit up straight. You should be approximately an arm's length away from the piano. Your hands should be relaxed and your feet should be on the floor unless you have to use one of the pedals. 
your fingers should be in a sort of C curve. It shouldn't be flat or bent inwards. The most basic thing you can play on a piano is just one note at a time. As you can see in this handy diagram at the top right, the black keys on a piano actually have a sort of pattern. Two black and then three black. The note just before the first black, black key in the two series of two is called the C. And the note that most people will start playing the piano on for the first time will be the C closest to the middle, called middle C. Once you know that, you can start playing chords, which is when you play when you use two or three or four fingers to play notes at the same time. For example, dyad chords, triad chords, or tetrad chords. Next is major and minor key. Major and minor key are two groupings of how a piece feels, the general feeling of a piece. A major key is characterized by a more energetic, lively, or happy feeling, and a minor key is often more melancholic or sometimes even sad. Let me pay you a couple of examples for the major key. For anyone asking, that was the opening of Let It Be. And here's an example for minor key. That was a segment from Batman the Animated Series. And finally, there's dynamics, which is, put simply, how loud or soft a note sounds. Saying it that way can make it feel unimportant, but don't be fooled. It's extremely important because it conveys most of the emotion in the piece. Let me play a piece with and without dynamics. First, without it. As you can see, it sounds devoid of any emotions at all. Too energetic, lively, and harsh. Here's with dynamics. As you can see, the piece now sounds much better. So that's all you need to know for playing the piano, and I've already gone over its parts, so it's finally time to go over the history. The piano was based on the pipe organ, like this one you see over here. And the invention of the first piano is credited to Bartolomeo Cristofori in the early 1700s. It was originally called the Forte Piano, and as you can see here, the shape of the grand piano originated with this. The piano was popularized by an Italian named Scipione Maffei, and the rightmost pedal, or the sustain pedal, was added by Gottfried Silberman, who Bach was an agent for. If you look closely, you can see that Silberman's pianos actually had inverse colors for their keys. Isn't that fun? As Vienna became the center of arts and culture in the world, Viennese pianos began to pick up popularity. Mozart played on these. More and more octaves were added over time to the piano. It started out with four, and then five, and then six, and then the seven plus four notes. The left and middle pedals were eventually added. And finally, we got the modern piano that we all know and love, along with electric keyboards and pianos, which synthesize the piano sound. 